life in the middle of nowhere. When Neil Armstrong went to the moon, it wasn't about getting there first. It wasn't about beating the Russians. It was about seeing life from a different perspective. As a, uh, as a young boy of eight years old when this happened, seeing the earth from this perspective really shaped my life. It told me how fortunate, how special, what are the odds that we get to be on this little blue marble? What, what are the odds? And this little blue marble told me that it's a place we need to take care of. Um, I, I, this whole, uh, this whole vision of earth as a little boy just really changed uh, my life. And I, I too wanted to be an explorer like, like Neil, but I wanted to go explore cold places. Why the cold? Well, I, uh, <laughs> I grew up in Minnesota. <laughs> uh, I grew up on a farm. Uh, summers were uh, hot and humid. Um, it actually was quite stifling for a young boy. Uh, and I always longed for winter. Well, one, I, could, I didn't have to do any more farm work once winter came in. But uh, uh, once winter came, it was uh, amazing. The, the lakes froze over. Uh, the snows came. Um, by having the lakes and rivers freeze over, it expanded my horizons for exploring as a boy. And I went on to uh, learn as much as I could about the cold. I, being from Minnesota, I pretty much thought uh, we were as far north as north goes. But lo and behold, north goes another 1,500 miles north of Minnesota. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then I went on to learn that there were Inuit people living up there. And I'm wondering, how do these people possibly stay warm? What do they eat? How do they dress? How do they travel? So I went on to learn everything I could about those folks over the years, and this led to basically 30 years of polar exploration for me. One of the, the, the expeditions that were probably the most dear to my heart uh, that we did was we did the very first ever circumnavigation of Greenland. Now, Greenland's 6,500 miles around. It took us 22 months in a tent to get around it. All non-motorized. We kayaked around the south, and we dog sledded around the north. And I just did this with one other friend of mine, John Holzer from Australia. Now, when people ask me to describe Greenland, I tell them it's where ice is born. <laughs> this is where ice is born. Uh, it, it actually has uh, all the north, most of the North American iceberg or uh, northern hemisphere icebergs come from Greenland. Um, the whole uh, uh, Arctic Ocean dumps out 85% of its Arctic Ocean sea ice down the east coast of Greenland and up the west coast. So the whole periphery of that island is, uh, has a blockade of ice around it about five miles wide. So it's one of the reasons it's never been circumnavigated. Um, and you can kind of see from the pictures of John here standing on a little ice pan uh, how difficult it would be to get around Greenland. Uh, we, uh, when we couldn't paddle our kayaks <clears throat> anymore, we would simply pull the kayaks up on an ice floe and we'd drag that boat across until we could find uh, water to paddle again in. Um, in the north, we traveled with sled dogs, and these aren't any old, uh, regular sled dogs. These are the Sherman tanks of the mushroom world. These are, uh, they live a feast and famine lifestyle with the polar Inuit for over 5,000 years. Um, it's the same dog that Robert E. Perry used to discover the North Pole in 1909. So these dogs were going to be our companions for the entire North part. Um, so we ran traditional Inuit fan hitch with our dogs, um, and they worked for us each day of the journey around the North, some 3,000 miles around the North part. And they were an uh, uh, amazing source of entertainment every day we were on that trip. And they protected us against polar bears coming in for a visit. A lot of our expeditions seem insurmountable. 
I mean like, like going on to the Arctic Ocean. The Arctic Ocean is one and a half times bigger than the United States, plunges to a depth of 14,000 feet deep, and we gotta pull 250 pound sleds for 600 miles from Canada to the North Pole. How are we gonna do that? You get to the edge of this ocean and go, uh, how many days am I gonna be doing this? Uh, how many miles do we gotta travel? But you don't think about that. You think about just one day at a time. Uh, don't think about the miles or the number of days you're gonna be gone. This is our job. We're gonna get in tune with the environment and get moving and just do what we needed to do. So on this expedition was uh, called the One World Expedition. Uh, it was to bring attention to climate change and the receding sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. And along that 600 miles journey, we would be, Eric Larson and I would be measuring ice thickness measurements for over 600 miles for the Snow and Ice Data Center in Colorado. Um, when we get to these, now you got to think of the Arctic Ocean as a kind of a, a frozen body of water like a big lake, right? And uh, a really big lake. And uh, sometimes we get to these cracks in the ocean called leads where we either have to jump across or we have to use a little block of ice to move across. Uh, sometimes we had to swim. And we would don dry suits. We'd have our ski outfit on, but we'd just fit in this big Gumby suit. And we, Eric and I would do the rock, paper, scissors to see who had to go in the water. And then one of us would do the backstroke across this thin ice, dragging the boats behind, uh, behind us with a rope tied to our foot. And then the other person would just ride on the boats. Um, and then to just spice things up, we had uh, uh, polar bear encounters. We had five polar bear attacks on this expedition. I'll tell you about one of them. Uh, we're about three weeks onto the ice, and I got the sleeping bag pulled up tight against my face, and I'm just shutting my eyes, and I'm dreaming about eating a steak. And all of a sudden, I hear woof. And I open up my eyes, and the ceiling of the tent is pushed against my face. And we, Eric and I both knew it was a polar bear on the tent. It's the only thing it could be. So the only thing we could do, two brave polar explorers, was scream. <laughs> and as, as soon as we screamed, the tent popped back to its original uh, dimensions. I looked out the door very cautiously, and the bear was just hightailing it across <laughs> the ice cap. I think he was much more scared than we were. Needless to say, we didn't get any sleep for the next two days. Um, uh, with the age of modern day uh, polar exploration coming to an end, a lot of the geographical and exploration first had already been done. Uh, I moved my sights to a more personal journey, a solo winter ascent of Denali in January. Uh, Denali is uh, North America's highest peak. It is 20,300 feet approximately, uh, but it's a really gnarly mountain to do it in winter. It blows 60 miles an hour. Uh, sometimes up to 100 miles an hour, minus 50 to minus 70 below zero on the summit. And I'm going to try to tackle this solo. How I'm going to do that is I, um, I, if you're traveling solo, of course, there's no ropes. So the only thing that will keep me attached to the mountain are the crampons on my feet and two ice axes. And, um, and uh, just moving up very slowly, very methodically, very focused on my footing. At night, I, uh, at, at the end of five hours of, uh, of, of, of climbing, because that's the only uh, amount of usable light you have in the Arctic winter, um, I spent an hour and a half to two hours building a snow shelter. So what I'll do is I'll dig four feet down, I'll put snow blocks over the top of it, and the incentive for building a snow shelter on Denali in the middle of winter is if you're too tired to build your snow shelter, you're gonna be dead by morning. So uh, sometimes I have to spend up to a week uh, inside one of these uh, rudimentary uh, snow shelters waiting for a time to uh, make my bid for the summit. And on January, 2015, at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I was the first to reach the summit of Denali in January. Uh, that, was, that was my fourth try, my fourth winter, after spending over 100 days over the course of four winters trying to get to the summit, but finally made it. But a lot of people ask me, how 
do you find the time or the resource to do, to do these things? And of course, I got a few sponsors, but, but really it's, for me, it's about um, I, living really simply with little things. I, 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 I don't have many material things. I have this small little car that I drive. Don't ask me about the chickens on the roof. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, I live in a small cabin uh, in the woods, and I always think uh, small things, small problems, big things, big problems. So that's, uh, that's how I've lived most of my life. But during, during the, the journey, during all my expeditions, the things that reminds me the most is just um, how small, fragile, and special our life is in the middle of nowhere. Thank you so much.